Hello and welcome to the GRC Red Flag Series brought to you by GRC World Forums and GRC 2020 Research and myself, your host, Michael Rasmussen, the GRC Pundit. The GRC Red Flag Series is a show which focuses to identify, debate, discuss, and interact on the current and future critical risks and regulatory changes and challenges that impact your business. I'm pleased to be hosting this eighth edition of the GRC Red Flag Series. If you missed the previous editions, don't worry. You can catch up on the on-demand episodes by visiting the on-demand section on the left-hand side of the site. In today's GRC Red Flag Series, we are looking at GPRC. Yes, GPRC, not just GRC. We're adding the P. GPRC, how does GRC drive performance in banking and finance, sponsored by Corporator? Corporator can digitally model a customer's business management system to, pro to provide a holistic central point of governance, management, and assurance of the corporation's performance, risk, and compliance. Using Corporator, organizations can align business objectives with risk and compliance strategies and move away from old legacy internal reporting to modern transparency by enabling information flow both horizontally and vertically. Corporator, Corporator has offices in 10 global locations and as a worldwide partner network. As ever, we have a fantastic edition ahead of us and we'll be joined by many esteemed guests. First, we'll have Ova, and then uh, who's the director of GRC Solutions at Corporator. And then in a little bit, after the fireside chat with Ova, we'll have Anja, the head of business performance management at Spare Bank. To get started, we will be having a conversation with Ova, uh, the director of GRC Solutions at Corporator. Hi, and welcome to our conversation with Ova, the Director of GRC Solutions Incorporator. Let's welcome Ova to tell us a little bit more about himself, Incorporator. Hello, Michael. Good to see you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, can you, likewise. Can you, can you give a little background on your on yourself, Incorporator? Yeah, a little bit of background. Um, I'm a technologist. Um, I've been working in the GRC space for... Well, I'm getting old, Michael. So I say 20 plus years. It's actually 25. Um, and um, a background of, of a corporator. Well, you, you said it very well. You read it very well. Um, um, GRC, digitalization software, um, where we align with performance, uh, optionally with performance. A very exciting platform. I joined corporator four years ago, um, but my background is, is technology and, uh, and GRC, that combination. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here today, joining us on this episode of the GRC Red Flag series. Uh, my first question to explore with Yova is, what are the challenges you see that financial services firms are facing? What keeps them up at night? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a big question, Michael. Um, well, Financial institutions, they are very familiar with generating profit from financial risks. Actually, the premise for these business models is upside risk. Uh, Non-financial risks, on the other hand, have by many only been considered as downside risks. Uh, Non-financial risks have become a huge cost to the banks due to incurred direct and indirect financial losses. Over the decades, this potential downside has grown larger and larger, while the non-financial risk domain has increased in complexity. So um, in the financial risk domain, the risk of loss resulting from using inaccurate models to make decisions, that is called a model risk. In the non-financial risk domain, the concept of model risk, that's not common. And one can ask, what is the greater risk an inaccurate model or the lack of a model. Um, the scope and complexity of non-financial risk domain have also introduced a, a range of organizational cost drivers that can be reduced and even eliminated. In addition to the consequences of direct and indirect financial losses, senior executives are facing issues from areas such as reputational damage, misconduct, security breaches, poor performance, failure to comply with laws and regulations, 
to mention a few. Uh, and Michael, most do credit risk well, or to satisf satisfaction at least. Um, my observations are that banking and finance, they struggle more in the non-financial risk domain. Um, and lack of overview of non-financial risks and the lack of a holistic GRC program impact their performance. And when you ask me about the challenge financial services is facing, I must speak on the background of being a technology vendor in the GRC space. So um, I, I see a common challenge to provide a holistic view for assurance purposes. That's maybe number one. For instance, supervisor audit, they seek a complete assurance portal for compliance purposes. And many banks and insurance companies, they struggle to go from digitalized unstructured data like Word, PowerPoint, into what we call real digitalization with structured data, data quality, processes, orchestration for the entire GRC domain. Um, and I said that the NFR or non-financial risk domain is becoming so complex. It is very hard or even impossible to, to govern, manage, and assure a holistic GRC program without a professional GRC software in place. Um, and my, my, maybe my last point, the lack of a model for non-financial risk and how it affects performance is basically a risk. This isn't easy. It's actually probably fairly complex for organizations because the real world is complex. I wrote an article for the, for the Institute of Risk Management in London called Navigating Chaos because there's changing regulations and changing risks and changing business environment. And you've got to keep all that in sync. And, and I'm just reading an article that I, I shared with you earlier this morning, uh, but I'm not sure if you saw it in your email, but uh, uh, from the Wall Street Journal, how one large global bank, one, one of the big ones, um, is getting a lot of uh, scrutiny right now because their, mm. their risk and control management systems aren't adequate. Yeah. And, and so they, they, they haven't, and, uh, even, even the, the big guys in the space haven't necessarily properly addressed this uh, thoroughly. Now, yes, it's, uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, go on, go on. No, uh, um, I totally agree. And uh, we, we see this every day. Um, we're not only working with banking and finance, but uh, banking and finance is uh, a big part of our market. So uh, and it's a bit peculiar that uh, uh, this area has not been addressed more than it uh, has. And, and one of the things you state that sort of strikes me from some of the stuff I've written in my research is that, I, I mean, what's more uh, at risk, not having a model or an inaccurate model? And the, the challenge is the world's so dynamic and complex that our models oftentimes are quickly out of date uh, because the, and, and, and models can never completely represent the real world because the, the real world has way so, so many variables in it that uh, um, models can provide some approximation of the real world, but never accurately represent the real world. Mm -hmm. But, but, and as the world changes, you know, it, it requires that, uh, uh, our models evolve and change with them as well. But I think one of the things we need to critically think about uh, is not only how do we use our left brain for risk management and with that performance, um, which is the logical structured thinking about risk and those models, but also bring in our right brain to be able to think, where can those models break down? What are they not telling us? I, I think we need to also bring in some more creative thinking on risk and to um, supplement that left brain thinking on risk. What do you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, to the core, I, I think uh, um, having an in inaccurate model is uh, to is preferred over a, a non-existing model. Yep. Uh, and of course, you, you need to always improve, and that's also a core principle in GRC: uh, continuous in, uh, improvement. So. Uh, well, the, the, there it is. You, you brought up the acronym. The uh, the acronym I love so dearly: governance, risk management, and compliance. Um, I, I can tell you how I define GRC, but I'll put that on the, on the table for a second and, and ask you, Ova, what is GRC from your perspective? From my perspective? Well, you have the, 
You have the answer, Michael, but um, I humbly have adopted your uh, definition of GRC and I love it very much. Um, but I tend to communicate it uh, as a toolbox for getting your ducks in a row in order to achieve your performance objectives. Um, of course, there's a lot, lot to it. And uh, uh, I, I really love the, your and OCEG's definition of it. Um, and I, I, can, I, I can read it out loud for, for our audience. GRC is the integrated collection of capabilities that enable an organization to reliably achieve objectives, address uncertainty, and act with integrity. Well written. Well, thank Kudos. you. Um, I, I take a lot of pride in working with OSEG on that. Uh, but uh, but it, just to break that apart, that for me, that uh, reliable achievement of objectives piece of it is the governance piece. Uh, addressing uncertainty is risk management. Uh, and in fact, ISO 31000, the Interna International Standard on Risk Management says risk is the effect of uncertainty on what? On objectives. And so there's a relationship to the reliable achievement of objectives, the governance, to the managing uncertainty of those objectives, the risk management, and the active integrity is the compliance piece. And, and there, there's a flow to that. So uh, that, that, that's how I've defined GRC. And it sounds like uh, um, it, we're very much aligned there, Ova. Um, and, and so just from a, a GRC perspective, how is Corporator engaging in helping uh, financial services firms just on a purely GRC perspective? We'll bring performance management into it in just a second. Um, yeah, um, so, well, to me, GRC is this wide umbrella that basically address everything um, that we can think of within the GRC domain. Uh, and we have seen different acronyms uh, lately, IRM, uh, for instance. Um, it basically boils down to GRC. Um, I, I would think that many will think of GRC as governance risk and control and reflecting to uh, SOX and financial controls. But I actually believe, believe in this more wider um, definition that yourself have for, for, for GLC. And that is also what we're promoting to our customers. But uh, as a technology vendor, we humbly uh, come into the picture um, with the mindset of that the, the technology is an enabler for um, GRC and it will not solve GRC on its own. You need people, processes and other tools, and data um, for the holistic um, picture. And we have just this small part, uh, the technology that enables everything. Now, well, I think we both very much agree on the definition of GRC. The, the reality when organizations appoint, uh, approach GRC, it's almost backwards. Uh, so often, it, it may be the way a lot of organizations you know, like will grasp onto GRC uh, a strategy. Um, the, it, maybe we should call the acronym you know, CRG because it usually starts with compliance. <laughs> they might move into risk and, and down the road, maybe hit governance. Um, cause I, I think too often we put the cart before the horse uh, to, to use that, uh, an analogy, but, uh, uh, and, and so we, GRC becomes a compliance exercise and then maybe a risk management and governance is often sidetracked and forgotten. Uh, but if we look at GRC, GRC is really about the reliable achievement of objectives. It, it, it's about those objectives and those could be entity level objectives at the highest level of the organization. They can be division, department, process, project or even asset level objectives. Um, and, and so we've got different types of objectives and, and governance is about reliably achieving objectives while addressing the uncertainty, the risk to those objectives and compliance and should be the follow through, not the starting point. Uh, and and that, that's why I find Corporator so fascinating is because Corporator started as a performance management solution and then mm -hmm. built risk in that context and compliance in that context. Um, and, and so uh, you differentiate yourself out there to financial services firms and other industries by being, you know, that top driven performance management focus. Uh, and, and, and so what is performance management from your perspective? Um, 
Well, from, from my perspective, it is the capability to execute on a strategy and to achieve your objectives. Um, it's very aligned with your own definition. Uh, and, and the result is principal performance. Performance in, in different areas of your business. Uh, it could be uh, financial stability, increased profitability, uh, compliance related performance goals, resilience, assurance. So the, the list is, is very long, but uh, on a top level, I think that we can measure performance in, in the financial domain, strategic domain, compliance, resilience, and assurance. Um, uh, but um, interestingly, um, you mentioned that the, the compliance that is a driver for, for, for governance and, and risk. And, and we see that very much in, in um, for, for instance, uh, regimes that are, um, um, I can take an example, uh, individual accountability and conduct. It's um, regulation um, in, in um, multiple countries. Um, and it actually mandates governance. So in order to stay compliant with the senior manager reg regime in, in UK, you, you need to have this proper governance around your senior managers. Um, and another example is that you need to um, adapt a risk management system in order to stay compliant in different industries, for instance, banking and finance. So it's very much driven by compliance, as you say. Yes, definitely. And I think one of the interesting perspective is, is while there's a natural flow from governance to risk management to compliance uh, in a flow, these also also happen simultaneously because they provide proper balances and tension. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we can try to aim performance with, and, and try to achieve performance without really looking at risk and go in a lot of different directions or in this era of ESG, forget about the integrity of the organization and completely get ourselves into ethical issues and in and, and violation of what our values are. Uh, and, and so I also think while we might look at a, a natural linear progression of this acronym GRC uh, and, and with its involvement in, in performance as well, um, uh, there's also a proper understanding that it's just not like a linear focus, but these are all sort of happening, happening simultaneously and provide proper tensions for balance to the organization. Mm -hmm. hey, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And this um, uh, intrinsic um, coupling of uh, and the relationship between all the uh, objects in this space is very fascinating. And that is also something that cooperator provides solutions for to, to map out, map all these uh, relationships um, that are uh, like a cause and effect on each other. So speaking of relationship, what, how do you define the relationship of GRC and performance management? Is it just the G and GRC? Um, I, I'm not sure if, if that's your perspective because we're, you're also talking about GPRC. So well, what is the relationship of GRC and performance management and how should financial services organizations be, start thinking about how to approach this? Um, yeah, um, let's take another example. Uh, for instance, in performance, we have this um, performance measurement, uh, meaning that we are measuring the results of a capability. Um, and performance measurement exists in many GRC disciplines. Um, so th there is a performance aspect of, of, of uh, most GRC uh, areas. And for instance, information security uh, I think we used that as, a, as an example earlier. Um, there is a, actually a standard for this ISO 2704 uh, in the 2701 series. That is a collection of different performance metrics for measuring the performance of your information security program. Um, and that is the most operational way of, of um, measuring um, uh, your GRC program. Um, but... Uh, all of these measurements can be aggregated up the chain, uh, up the chain of the program, uh, and expressed as operational, tactical, or strategic uh, key risk indicators or key performance indicators, and it all uh, relates. Uh, so, what is the relationship of G 
GRC and performance management. So performance is all about achieving objectives. Um, governance is to do it reliably, I think. Uh, so I, I would like to, to um, comment on your definition a bit there, Michael. Please do. Um, can, can, can we say that um, governance is to reliably achieve objectives and the achieve objectives part is maybe about the performance. Um, I'm not asking you directly, but um, I have some thoughts around that and I, I find that uh, intriguing because performance might be present in that definition. Um, so I'm um, explaining further. So I, I presume you have a car, Michael. Um, so you have this analogy, what is the purpose of brakes? Most will think that to, it, uh, brakes are to be able to stop the car. Um, but the primary, primary outcome of brakes is actually to go fast. So that, that's uh, where you have the performance aspect of it. Um, so, so a passive risk manager, he will maybe push on those brakes. However, uh, a business aligned risk manager will reduce the uncertainties for the business to go faster. Um, and in, in credit risk, you know, market liquidity, concentration, um, uh, there is a more direct relationship between risk and financial performance. But in the non-financial risk domain, it's more subtle and intangible. It is an ever-changing domain that spans across the entire organization, horizontally and vertically. Um, and back to our information security example, uh, an information security program that is not performing will pose a risk to the bank that might have consequences for performance on many levels. Um, and many banks, they are focusing on performance and they tend to define key performance indicators that are lagging in nature, meaning that they have a, they are recorded post event. Uh, they show you what has happened. Um, and in most instances, you cannot do anything about it. Uh, but the risk domain offer leading indicators, key risk indicators that if designed correctly will show you how indicators of likelihood for something to happen and the consequences for your performance if the scenario if the scenario materializes. Uh, so there is a, this cause and effect relationship between the operational, tactical and strategic domain. Uh, we can call it the value driver tree with early warning detectors. Um, and as I said, it's an intrinsic model that can be digitalized to achieve business value or principal performance at many levels. Excellent. So th this sort of comes together in what you call GPRC, Governance, Performance, Risk, and Compliance. Can you go through this a little more for us? Um, yeah. Um, being a technologist uh, and a software company founder, it's natural for, for me to use technology to solve challenges. So in, in 2018, um, I was working as a management advisor in the US, providing advice and solutions in the, in the intersection of compliance, risk, quality, and performance. And I discovered that most management consultants, they were providing what I call a, a dead binder uh, after their uh, completed work instead of digitalizing uh, their recommended methodology, initiatives, processes, and tasks, and so on. Uh, as a living software implementation. So I founded a, a company in the US. Um, I was developing this platform for holistic digital transformation of GRC programs. And long story short, uh, I met the CEO of Corporator in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and actually we are from the same town in, in Norway. Um, and I was telling him what I was about to do. and. Uh, he showed me the corporate platform. And I realized that the platform I was seeking and building did already exist. 
however, as you said, Cooperator had this performance focus. Um, but however, the, the platform was highly capable of digitalizing any concept under the GRC umbrella uh, using the built-in platform capabilities such as organizational model, process engine, document engine, data integration, and, and so on. Everything that you need basically to, to digitalize your GRC program. And he asked me to join Cooperator. And um, um, soon after I joined Cooperator, I wrote a blog and I, I, um, I gave it the title, emphasizing the P in GRC. Uh, trying to align this performance and GRC uh, for our um, way forward. Um, talking about uh, this relationship, um, we have been using the acronym GPRC ever since, and it has actually been adopted uh, by many, many, many companies since then. And it makes perfectly sense with your own definition of, of, of GRC uh, and the principal performance. And my intention was not to step on either your or Carol Switzer's toes, uh, Carol from, from OCEG. Um, but I, le I learned later on that you actually considered using the P in the acronym when you established GRC, is that right? Was it 2003? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that was all part of what uh, you've already referenced, principal performance, which is one of the terms from OSEG there. Uh, and but you know as, as much as I feel that the definition of GRC and the acronym acronym of GRC holds water and is good, um, as I've already mentioned, I, I think adding the P to it right now sort of right sizes this because too often these companies out there, financial services firms as well as other industries, it, it's really CRG and not GRC. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're putting the cart before the horse, and I think. Adding that P further emphasizes the performance aspect of it and unpacks that governance piece further to get people thinking in the right perspective instead of the backwards thinking so many people have or so many organizations have on GRC today. Mm. Um, sp speaking of emphasizing the P or GPRC, um, interestingly, there's a fine line between poor governance and risk. So um, when I speak of poor governance, I think of poor craftsmanship um, running your business. And um, we often see that there is a mix between uh, risk and poor governance. Uh, and I think it's two separate things, but it, it um, um, both will impact your performance. Uh, basically, if not done right, um, th there's a fine line between them, and then they, they meet at the intersection of governance and performance and risk. Um, um, so, actually, uh, paying attention to time here, Michael, um, lack of performance could basically be caused by bad craftsmanship or bad governance or uh, a materialized risk. Both can have performance consequences. And um, I, I'm thinking um, uh, we have invited Anya today um, from one of our customers, and they are focusing on uh, on GPRC in in their bank. Uh, the, the bank is called SNM, one of the largest savings banks in Norway, and it's it's located in northern Norway by the Arctic Circle. Fantastic landscape and a, it's a very exciting bank. And um, you might want to introduce Anya to us. Definitely. So now I'd like to bring on that additional panelist, Anya, to help us navigate through this topic more. Anya will be joining us next for our panel discussion. Hello and welcome back to our panel discussion. Alongside Ova of Corporator, we now have Anya, the head of business performance management at Spare Bank. So if we can bring them in so we can give us a bit of background on themselves, we've already heard from Ova. So now let, let's talk to Anya here. Anya, can you give us a bit of background on who you are and your role at Spare Bank? Yeah. 
definitely, Michael. Thank you for uh, for having me. Um, it's very exciting to come and talk to the most uh, knowledgeable guys about GRC, um, just to lay the foundation. So SNN is um, one of uh, the big spotter banks in Norway. Um, we started our, I would say, updated uh, journey towards business performance management back in 2020. Um, it doesn't mean that we never had um, performance management before or any type of metric um, reviews. Um, we did have scorecards, balanced scorecards, these type of tools before. Um, and we were always good with following up uh, key KPIs and KRIs, especially on the financial side. Um, but one of the things that management wanted to look at uh, was this perspective of getting one way to work uh, across different legal entities. Uh, we are a financial group, so we do have um, some daughter companies and some stakes in, uh, in other legal entities within the Spotterbank N uh, sphere. Uh, so basically getting uh, the, I would say, the common terminologies, definitions, uh, ways of working across the group uh, was one of the perspectives that uh, management wanted to bring in with the, with the updated performance management way of working. That's a, background. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's some great background and intro there. So Anya, um, what are the, the challenges that Spare Bank has faced that brought you to this point, uh, or maybe you're currently facing? Uh, in other words, what, what, what keeps you up at night from a business perspective? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what is it not at the moment? <laughs> we have uh, very challenging um, ways forward, I would say we've had a decade of uh, financial strong um, uh, performance metrics, basically. Um, it's been uh, more or less easy to operate as a bank. Uh, we've also had many of our daughter companies that are um, um, kind of, you know, they're, they're every, every year bringing in more and more results. Um, but now we're getting to this point where interest rates are going up. What does that mean for customers? We have um, a very challenging a geopolitical um, situation right now, a lot of tension across different countries. We are located very closely to um, the Russian border, etc. Um, so of course, there's there's quite a lot of things moving in that area as well. Um, and when it comes to us as a bank, uh, we are located in the north. Uh, so a lot of our exports are relating to fish, oil, etc. Um, what does that mean in the long long term? Uh, with uh, with everything going on at the moment. So Ova, you know, I mean, Anya's like gone through the challenges they've faced. Is this pretty consistent with what you see with other financial services firms in the area? Um, yeah, it's 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 consistent, uh, but it has different flavors uh, around the world, of course. So, um, but it's it's on a high level consistent, I think. Yeah. Uh, Anya is talking about uh, her local area, of course, and uh, it's a special area. So Anya, so often, and, and Ova and I were just going through this in, in, in our fireside chat, too often there's this disconnect between GRC, governance, risk and compliance, and performance management. But by the definition, like the OSEG definition that Ova and I went through, they really belong in context together. How have you corrected this perspective and, and brought performance management into the governance, risk and compliance, particularly the risk and compliance uh, context of the organization? Um, it's a very good question. Um, so when we started out and we're still, I would say, heavy on the performance management side of things, we're um, collaborating very deeply with the corporator on the performance ma the performance management module, but we're also developing GRC modules as we speak. Um, so when it comes to kind of combining the different letters, and from my point of view, we do speak of GPRC, um, it's basically a little bit of a mix around of the letters uh, compared to how you, you uh, previously have spoken about it. So we actually tend to look at uh, GPRC as PGRC, where basically the user or whoever is um, defined in our um, performance module in our bank or our, our group 
uh, is basically the G. So roles and responsibilities relating to that uh, user. Um, in order to understand the full mandate of this user, it's both on a performance side, so the P, as well as a risking and compliance or control side uh, to the right. Um, so basically, we have, have started talking about performance, not just as uh, something that you're able to deliver based on your business area or your specialization within the group, but it's also this continuous balance between what you're able to deliver, so results, and viewing that as um, on the side of doing it with quality, so the risk and compliance side of things. Um, I wouldn't say that we are completely there yet, so we're still working on uh, bridging the two uh, sides and making it into one uh, common method methodology within the group, but we're definitely getting there. Excellent. And so, uh, from uh, Ova, I'll have you add on to that. You know, this disconnect between GRC and performance management and, and how Anya with Spare Bank has approached this. Have you seen others approach it the same way? Um, uh, any other things you can glean from your other customers and, and how to bridge this gap and bring performance into GRC? Um, yeah, I think uh, Anya's um, approach is to to um, focus on the P first, um, mm -hmm. and then bring in GRC and um, the quality aspects of it. And uh, um, we also see the other way around when they try to 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 focus on the GRC areas first, and then. They have this um, extended project of of aligning it with performance down the road. So um, any route uh, is applicable, and um, uh, you you can also do um, well. It's it's basically up to the business to to um, focus on what is important to them, um, and the GRC definition is so. Um, is so um, versatile that basically it, it um, allows you to 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 focus on the challenges that you have. So you you start to get your ducks in a row uh, with the ducks that is most important to you, uh, and you can add more ducks uh, down the road. Excellent. So in that context, oh, go, go on. Yeah, perfect. Um, I really like the the comment from Uwe regarding you know you can you can kind of start in either end you know you can start with the DRC side or you can start with performance management, building on components as you go. Uh, one of the the things that we have experienced at SNN was that when you uh, prepare for a common way of working across uh, measuring performance, defin defining performance, etc it's easier, at least from our perspective, to start with uh, the business metrics in the first run and then building on the risk and compliance side. But I'm sure that's depending on the organization in, in question. Mm. Um, um, another example from my side is uh, we, we, have, we have customers that maybe they, they start with just a tiny part of GRC, maybe a compliance program or um, yeah, um, information security, to, to use that as an example over again. Um, so when we provide advice to them, we always advise them to, to have some sort of alignment with the business aspect of it, the, the, what is actually important for the organization to perform so that they, they even align their information security program with um some high level performance objectives so it's not disconnected that means that uh it, it can be you, you can connect everything in this holistic um framework uh, as you go uh, and then uh, you, you you can start out small and you can grow big um as you go um, um you you were asking about this um, 
this gap, Michael. I think um, what we mentioned earlier, um, lagging indicators versus leading indicators and how to connect them, that is actually to to the core of um, how we we um, we align performance and GRC. Um, I don't know if you can talk into that, Anya. Um, yes. So, for example, um, when we do our uh, performance management uh, cycle, we always start with um, setting goals and planning. That's all based on kind of the key performance indicator, uh, getting that set right each year. Um, now that we've started to basically test it also with risk indicators, we can have we can basically see two sides of uh, the same question. So one is, for example, saying how many um, new loans should we um, scribe during the year? And if we only hunt that uh, goal, we might, again, kind of lose the balance between the risk and the performance. So once we also get up the credit risk, we get up uh, risk indicators regarding the uh, market, regarding customers themselves, uh, default levels, etc. We can be even earlier out saying, OK, let's adjust the performance number right now because it looks like the quality is getting a little bit uncertain or vice versa. Not sure if that's a good example of that, but that was the one that I could think of. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. So, you know, Oven, I've been talking about putting the cart before the horse and how yeah. GRC is sometimes CRG. Uh, but, but too often, that's how organizations approach it. They approach it first from compliance, then they might add on risk. And too often, risk management is actually a compliance exercise and not true risk management. Uh, and and the, if they, they might never get, they might never get to governance. What advice do you have to companies to correct this and, and flip this around where it's a flow from the G to the R to the C? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. It's very difficult to answer in a short, short amount of time, but I'll try my best. Um, so my perspective after working with um, a GRC program um, for a little while now, is that from my point of view, it's almost as though you need to think about a GRC program or kind of implementing GRC uh, as a new product development or uh, creating a new IT system for a customer. Um, so what I really recommend is to, before you start anything, start uh, thinking about, you know, what is the vision? What, where do you want to go with uh, GRC or GPRC? So holistic performance management, as I, I would call it. Um, what kind of value um, will this provide the organization and its employees and its customers and its stakeholders um, on the short and the long term? Um, and right around that time, you will also kind of get to know which type of um, components is it that you want to build long term relating to the culture, because that's, in my opinion, that's very much connected to this value and, and vision part. Um, once that is set, the question becomes, who are the users of this GRC solution or whether it's GPRC? Um, with every user or user group, for example, system owners was mentioned earlier by you, Michael. Um, they can be on a tactical level uh, with uh, leaders right on, underneath management group these type of either organizational aspects or role-based um, organizations uh, will basically have to classify what, who are the users and what is the so if or so what, sorry, <laughs> for the different user uh, users. Because when you have that, then you basically know um, more regarding um, who, who are kind of connected in this whole governance aspect, what are the risks to be managed, what type of compliance issues is it potentially in different areas? Uh, what type of controls are important to build for? And last but not least, what type of performance indica indicators are relevant for the various groups? Um, so that's that's kind of my recommendation to even start take one step back and think about the vision, the value. Once you've done that, the users and the so what for each individual uh, user group. 
uh, comment, Michael? Yeah. Um, oh, please. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I really like that you are you, you are mentioning users a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, it seems to me that you have a very strong focus on um, the people down in the lines, um, down in the first line, and um, and with many customers, we we all um, we, we see um, a reporting focus, so focusing on the top management, the board. Um, so I really like your 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 focus. Uh, can you speak a bit into that? How, how important that is to SNN, uh, to your bank, that um, that is, it's a holistic program. Um, yes, yeah. definitely. Um, so one of the, uh, before we even started working with, uh, with performance management, because that was the first part of JPRC that we started working on, um, we developed this uh, model that we call SNN model uh, for implementing performance management uh, in the group. Um, and we basically built this model uh, to be uh, throughout during the implementation of the new way of working, basically. Um, and in this model is three layers. The first outermost layer is the methods that we're using. So basically common steering principles, uh, common uh, steering processes, and of course, common um, steering information. Then we have the middle layer, which is basically the formalization of uh, the performance management or GRC components as well over time, um, which is basically a corporator or our, our IT tool. And the innermost uh, layer of this model is the user. So what we're basically saying with this model is that for every KRI, KCI or KPI, depending on where you are in the whole uh, four-letter uh, definition, mm. it should always be tailored to uh, the role and responsibility of the user in the middle. So we have developed it in such a way that um, each respective user group, depending on roles and responsibilities, have access to what their focus should be, what type of actions they're um, initiating based on the focus, and also what kind of insight um, the KPIs, KRIs, KCIs are driving. So it's it's always very set, kind of user centric, but it also yeah. makes it quite complex sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exciting. So th this brings me to a fascinating area that I'd love to explore with both of you, but in, in particularly as you folk as you brought in this idea of the user or the employee, you know what is the role of culture? and what corporators call in GPRC or what would I call GRC, what's the role of culture? Uh, you know, I, I'm a, a global ambassador for risk management for the Institute of Risk Management in London. And, and about a decade ago, we uh, built this guidance called Risk Culture Resources for Practitioners. And, and within this document, we have what we call the ABC model. You know, the attitudes of the individuals, whether they're frontline employees, middle management or executives, their attitudes shape the behavior of the organization. That behavior shapes the culture of the organization. And that culture has a symbiotic relationship that further influences attitudes and behavior, ABC, attitudes, behavior, culture. And it's all very symbi symbiotic and, and, and influential. So how do we develop and nurture a culture of integrated governance, performance, risk, and compliance? How do we deal with this and, and, and change? You know, because, you know, when you, we think about these functions of, you know, performance and risk and compliance, these aren't back office functions for, you know, the chief risk officer, the chief compliance officer. You know, those are facilitators of risk and compliance. And, and, and performance is owned by the business, but risk and compliance is owned by the business as well. And so how do we nurture and develop and foster this culture since you guys have brought the employees and users into this? Maybe that's a question for you, Anna. <laughs> I was hoping you would take it because it's a very uh, complex one. Um, well, I really like the ABC model. Um, that enables me to kind of break down culture for, from a conceptual point of view and, and try to kind of see how that fits in with, with um, how I see performance management, including DRC. 
Um, so I think when it comes to um, the behavior, I think that's something that you actually can um, facilitate for in an IT system. If you have kind of the good news stories, you have um, linked what type of insight each user needs to what type of behavior they should actually um, initiate based on that insight, etc. Um, you could actually, or that's at least in my thinking, uh, use the IT system to generate a certain type of um, behavior, mm -hmm. meaning a little bit of a culture aspect there. Um, and when it comes to attitudes, um, I'll go back to, to uh, one of my previous answers regarding, um, you know, how do you go around uh, starting with GPRC or DRC? Um, I think creating that vision and defining that value uh, will somehow, uh, or should at least, have a culture aspect embedded in it. So what type of attitudes is it that you want to foster with um, your business performance management system, whether it's only P or so, or so uh, performance management or across performance management and GRC. Do you have anything to add on that, Ova? Uh, I was thinking a little bit. Um, our role as a, as a technology vendor, um, I find that the, the, the culture part is a bit hard to, to, uh, to cover. Um, but um, on a high level, um, well, well, we always talk about the tone from the top. That's extremely important. Um, and um, the, the fact that the top um, acquire a system to get GRC right is a very good signal to send. It's a very good tone from the top. Um, and of course, what, what the Anya brings to the table where um, and we can we can add to the bit the, the behavior of the user, um, but all in all, uh, the techno the technology itself it's um, uh, I don't have very many arguments for 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 how to drive culture uh, with with technology besides the point that it helps you do it according to uh, how you would like to govern the program in your organization. Um, and of course, um, um, if done correctly, you can achieve the benefits of maybe an assurance portal if all the users behave and use the system uh, appropriately um, or accordingly. Uh, and that leads us into uh, the importance of user adoption. So um, user adoption and the culture um, goes maybe a bit hand in hand. So what we focus on in is the user adoption and to drive the culture. I really like that aspect, Ove, and I'd like just like to add on it because if you're focusing on um, the user and the usability of uh, an IT uh, technology or, or platform related around uh, GPRC, and you're able to kind of bring across the, the value for each individual user by actually entering, for example, corporator as we are, are um, um, implementing in SNN and using SNN, um, you really have a heightened uh, possibility of, of getting the user engaged and, and hopefully a very dedicated user over time. Yeah, and um, if you if you design your the screens so that the user actually gets um, uh, an indication or a notion of of how this data is used uh, up the chain, how this will drive performance, mm -hmm. then it can do something about the attitude uh, yeah. instead of just being a reporting tool uh, that is isolated from the performance world. Yeah. So uh, well, one of the things that sort of spurred my thought of asking that question was this article I read in The Economist magazine several years back. But I was actually looking at the cultures of one of the leading investment banks and comparing them to others in which 
in this financial services space. I mean, you, you can't separate out risk culture from performance culture. And, and one of the things that made them such a high performing investment bank, and I'm trying not to name names specifically here, uh, but uh, is that they had they, they, they developed this culture like in risk taking that risk had to be a collaborative effort. If you're taking a, a significant investment decision or risk, you had to get other people involved to get other perspectives on that. Uh, and, and, and they were really trying to develop this culture of performance and risk, integrated performance and risk management so that people weren't cavaliers, like they're out, weren't out going out there making risky decisions, even with great gains by themselves. And, and, and this investment bank was able to outperform a lot of their competitors uh, because of that culture itself. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, okay. interestingly, um, well, I, I think it's a very, very good uh, uh, example, Michael, and it, it, uh, it touches the, what we talked about um, in, in the beginning of this uh, uh, session. Um, so um, when you have this control of your model, uh, you're able to outperform. And, so um, that means it's, um, it's um, you, you don't have to have your the complete model in place before you start uh, with a uh, technology. Uh, my advice is to, to to get started and you you build as you go, um, focusing on the most important parts along the way. Which brings me to another question. And our final question today is what is the role of technology for bringing performance and GRC together in a financial services organization? I mean, on, on, Anya, you've already answered some of this, but can you, and just in a conclusion here, what's the role of leveraging corporator or whatever solutions that su supplement it in bringing performance and GRC together within your bank, Spare Bank? And then we'll turn over to Ova to see his thoughts on how their customers have leveraged and used it. Yes, sure. Um, so I already mentioned a little bit regarding how uh, we have developed this SNM model for um, implementing uh, performance management in GRC. So one of the key things that Corporator uh, is able to provide, or in this case, our technology provider is Corporator, um, is these numerous uh, ways of handling data across the organization or the group. Uh, so we're able to generate different uh, dashboards, basically, where you have this key information from a user perspective based on their roles and responsibilities. Um, you're able to go up in the organizational hierarchy to see how does that information uh, lead to uh, information on um, the level above the user. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you can actually follow this kind of red thread from uh, strategy, whether it's on the business side or risk uh, risk side, to see how it all kind of flows downwards, but also upwards, depending on where in the organization the user is sitting. Um, another aspect that I really like about uh, technology in, in GPRC, in which uh, I have been um, been really keen on on sharing in this forum as well is an IT system, uh, if any organization is wondering whether to invest in an IT system on, on GRC or not, uh, I can highly re recommend it because all of these, um, you know, what if, so what processes or things that typically are not necessarily in the gray zones, but you have, you're doing something maybe 90% of the time a certain way, then 10% uh, of the time you're doing it a different way. Um, a technology uh, tool will not necessarily allow for it to be uh, big differences in how you're executing, um, how you're looking upon things. So you're basically creating a much stronger and solid um, foundation, I would say, in how the business should be operating, whether it's relating to performance or risk and compliance. Those are two aspects that I want to want to kind of share um, relating to, to technology. I have some final thoughts, uh, Michael. Um, um, the financial service industry, they are familiar with uh, uh, Basel. On uh, the Basel committee, they have um, uh, some guidelines uh, recorded in BCBS 239. 
Uh, it's about prudent risk management. And um, very, um, uh, although uh, those guidelines are focusing on credit risk, I think the principles of BCBS 239 are valuable for the non-financial risk domain as well. Uh, and basically, it, uh, the 14 principles outline how you, you should achieve this basically principle performance in, in financial services. Uh, it is aimed to, uh, for, for uh, globally and uh, domestically um, systemically important banks, uh, but also local smaller banks can benefit from, from the principles, I think. Um, yeah, that, that was my final word, basically, Michael. Um, uh, look at BCBS 239 uh, to, to help you model your prudent risk management to achieve performance in financial services. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists here today, Ova and Anya, for joining us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you as we unpack this area of governance, performance, risk, and compliance, GPRC, in the context of financial services. But so many of these lessons, I think, can be applied with whatever industry you're in, not just the financial services. Stay with us as for the next 30 minutes, I will be reporting on the biggest news stories within GRC in this past month. And this is GRC in the News, where I, Michael Rasmussen, your host, bring you the biggest stories from across governance, risk, and compliance. And so today, in the GRC report, we break it down by roles, like compliance and ethics roles, risk management roles, uh, and so much. But a lot of these news stories, as I've indicated in the past, involve a lot of different roles in the organization. And so it can be quite challenging uh, to be able to address this and be able to see this uh, in the organization today. But you know, let's look at GRC in the news. And today, you know, we're going to start with the role of corporate compliance and ethics. And so compliance and ethics. Some of the news that we've seen this past month include the joint statement from the United Kingdom and the USA on Financial Regulatory Working Group. The UK and the US participants held the sixth meeting of the UK-US Financial Regulatory Working Group uh, on, at the end of July. The working group was formed in 2018 to deepen bilateral regulatory cooperation with a view to the further promotion of financial stability, investor protection, fair, orderly, and efficient markets and capital information in both jurisdictions. Participants included a lot of the regulators from both sides of the pond, and how can we work together and create a more resilient and agile and stable financial system. Then we had the FCA's consumer duty will lead to a major shift in financial services. The Financial Conduct Authority in the UK has created this duty, which is made up of an overarching principle and new rules firms will have to allow. It will mean that consumers, your customers, should receive communications they can understand, products and services that meet their needs and offer fair value, and they get the customer support they need when they need it. There is a duty to the consumers, to the client. The organizations need to have clarity on expectations and, and the firms focusing on what their customers need should lead to more flexibility for firms to compete and innovate in the interests of consumers. This duty forms part of the FCA's, the Financial Conduct Authority's transformation to becoming a more assertive and data-led regulator in the United Kingdom. Then you've got British American Tobacco reserves 545 million US dollars for US sanctioned settlement. 
The Department of Justice and Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control have been probing the cigarette manufacturer since at least 2020, when it first disclosed the matter. British American Tobacco has not provided further detail regarding what potential sanctions it might have violated or when. But some sanctions were violated, it looks like, and they're putting a lot of money aside, over a half a billion dollars to address it. Next, we have the U.S. bank. Uh, a U.S. bank was fined $37.5 million over fake, fake accounts scheme. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, otherwise known as CFPB, handed down the discipline stating the bank's alleged practices from 2015 to 21 violated the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Consumer Financial Protection Act, and the Truth in Lending Act, and even the Truth in Savings Act. A lot of acts there. The CFPB accused this the accused U.S. bank of promoting sales goals, sales campaigns, and financial incentives that led U.S. bank employees to open accounts without permission. It added the bank had inadequate policies and procedures to prevent and detect these accounts. We all know if you follow any of my work that I love policies and policy management, one of the most active areas that I'm involved in within uh, all industries, financial services, life sciences, Organizations have to get a hold of their policies. And so many of these organizations have policies scattered all over on disparate systems and file shares. They're out of date in different templates. Policies and procedures are a mess in most organizations. Many organizations don't even know what policies they have. And again, here you have another example of a bank that had inadequate policies and procedures to, to prevent and detect these accounts. Policies address risks like this. There wouldn't be a policy if there wasn't a risk. But here you had inadequate policies to address the risk. Next, we have a focus on victims' rights, led leads invest, to investor payouts in Credit Swiss case. When the U.S. Department of Justice said earlier this year it would place an increased emphasis on compensating the victims of white-collar crime, lawyers for Credit Suisse, Credit Swiss had already taken steps to ensure their client was complying with the new policy. The Swiss bank in October signed a deal with the U.S. and the United Kingdom uh, authorities to resolve investigations into a $2 billion fraud and money laundering scheme centered on a tuna fishing project in Mozambique. As part of that agreement, the bank agreed to pay restitution to a group of investment firms, pension funds, and money managers. Robinhood's crypto unit fined $30 million by New York's top financial regulator. The New York State Department of Financial Services imposed a $30 million fine on the cryptocurrency trading unit of online brokerage Robinhood Markets for alleged violations of anti-money laundering and cybersecurity regulations in the department's first crypto enforcement action. The New York State Financial Regulator, NYDFS, said Tuesday that Robinhood Crypto failed to maintain and certify compliant anti-money laundering and cybersecurity programs. As part of the consent order, Robin would also be required to retain an independent consultant to evaluate their compliance program for several years and report back on it. Not only is there a fine, but there's a follow-up to it. I've said before, you know, a lot of times people just look at the cost of the fine when understanding regulatory risk. The cost of the fine is just one aspect. There's $30 million in this aspect. In my experience, a lot of firms spend an equal amount to the fine on the investigation costs and, and, and legal costs. So if, if Robinhood spent 30 million, has a $30 million fine, there's a good chance they also spent $30 million in the investigation and response costs. And then you have all the added uh, uh, um, fees of the, like this consultant uh, or sometimes it's called a compliance monitor coming in year after year. You know, the cost of an incident is much more than just the fine. JP Morgan's copy and paste job, no good as identity theft policy, the SEC says. J.P. Morgan Securities grabbed language and examples from the federal identity theft red flag rules and called that part of its identity theft policy. The Securities and Exchange Commission said in an announcing a settlement agreement with the company last week for violating regulation SID. The SEC credited the company for its handling of identity theft risks, but its approach was independent of its written policy. Again, you have a policy that is not adequate. You can't just cut and paste you know, and, and say, this is our policy. That policy has got to fit your environment and it's got to be lived and breathed in your environment. You know, just having a policy out there actually could be a liability if it's not enforced. And I've got a policy here on my laptop back in 2000. Everybody, it was a code of conduct. Everybody was copying to be their code of conduct because they thought it was the best code of conduct. 
I'm talking Enron's code of conduct, which led to Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, having a great policy isn't enough. It has to be enforced. In this case, the, the policy itself wasn't just good enough because it was just a cut and paste job of some language and needed a lot more to it. Firms look to trim SOX costs on 20th anniversary. I just brought Sarbanes-Oxley up back in 2002, 20 years later, 2022. Happy birthday, Sarbanes-Oxley. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 required public companies to set up internal controls over financial reporting and have them audited by accounting firms. But with costs rising due to inflation, accountants are finding ways to save money. Big four firm Deloitte released a report last month coinciding with the 20th anniversary of this landmark act. Using companies to take a, urging companies to take a fresh look at their SOX compliance programs to find ways to modernize them and use up-to-date technology. There's a lot of places for automated controls and things that streamline Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Look into it. I cover them in my research. <clears throat> Liz Truss, the new prime minister of the United Kingdom, to launch war on technocrats by merging city watchdogs. Tory leadership in the UK, the front runner, well, now is the prime minister, Liz Truss, is planning an immediate shakeup of the city's major regulators in London if she wins the race to become prime minister, which she did win. Truss is planning to merge the Financial Conduct Authority, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, and the Payment System Regulator, PSR, <clears throat> into a single new body. The Conservative Party's Members of Parliament plans uh, comes as part of the Truss wider war on technocrats, according to the Financial Times. Truss, who is a reported to be personally critical of the FCA, uh, uh, is well, as again, she won. So we could expect maybe this to be starting to move forward. But obviously, uh, the other things are happening in the United Kingdom that are putting things on hold right now. And, and with that, we give our respect to Queen Elizabeth and what she's done. And then the SEC modifies whistleblower program to reverse Trump era change. The Securities and Exchange Commission responded to concerns voiced by advocates voted Friday to remove a limit on whistleblower awards that was set during the Trump administration. The change by the Democratic majority, SEC, eliminates the Wall Street regulator's ability uh, to deny awards to tipsters who might otherwise be eligible for a payout from another agency. Incentivizing those whistleblowers is a great way to get more people to blow the whistle and help us correct major wrongdoings in the organization. But it also has its challenges as well. SEC whistleblower awards program might have a revolving door problem, <laughs> as I was just stating on these challenges. Over the past several doors, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission whistleblower awards program, has been championed by lawyers and politicians for offering powerful incentives to tipsters to come to the regulator with evidence of wrongdoing. And we just see ah, that some of the limitations there were just removed in the previous article. A new study, however, finds that almost a quarter of the SEC's whistleblower awards have gone to law firms of attorneys who have close connections to the regulator, potentially deterring other whistleblowers from coming forward. Wells Fargo is fined $22 million for alleged whistleblower retaliation. So, <laughs> again, another one on whistleblowers. Wells Fargo and company has, was fined more than $22 million by the U.S. Labor Department for allegedly firing a senior manager in its commercial banking unit after the employee reported concerns about misconduct to company management. The Labor Department's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which imposed the penalty, ordered the bank to pay a Chicago-based whistleblower a range of damages, including back wages, interest, lost bonuses and benefits, and compensatory damages. Bear to pay $40 million to settle long-running false claim suits. Bear's alleged misconduct concerning the drugs uh, Traciol, Avalox, and Bacol resulted in hospitals and doctors filing false claims to Medicaid and Medicare and violating the laws of 20 states and the District of Columbia. The Department of Justice said in a press release, the allegations came to a light after former marketing employee Lori Simpson filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the District of New, New Jersey in 2005, claiming the sales team paid kickbacks to providers for prescribing the, to these drugs. Bayer's sales employees also paid kickbacks to hospitals and doctors. And it's coming to Bayer now, finally. Uh, a 40, a, it's bearing down on Bayer $40 million to settle this long-running false claims lawsuit that goes back 17 years. 
now we transition to the topic of ESG, environmental social governance. One of the biggest topics in my research and interactions, everybody's talking about this. A day doesn't go by, an hour doesn't seem to go by where I'm not <laughs> referencing or talking about ESG to some organization around the world. So why sustainable governance and corporate integrity are crucial for ESG? How should we define and assess the G in ESG? So often we, we, we start with the E and get trapped there and might get into the S, but we fail to look at the G. But the G is critically important. And I call it ESGRC to bring in the GRC piece of it too with the common element of governance. Uh, but the G in ESG, where does anti-corruption fit with emerging ESG frameworks? U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, U.K. Bribery Act, SEP and in France, and more. And can a company or investment fund be considered sustainable if corporate integrity is left on the sidelines as certification criteria reporting priorities? Answering these questions is becoming increasingly urgent. The momentum around environmental social governance, ESG, factors is rapidly solidifying into influential corporate rating frameworks, investment criteria, and binding law despite relative inattention to the G in ESG. At the same time, the war in Ukraine and the response from companies and investors is focusing on it. Let's put the G in ESG and deliver on it. Will ESG regulations surpass SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank Act in total cost of compliance? Some experts believe that ESG agendas are going to dwarf the two major corporate compliance and financial industry overhauls of recent decades. SOX and Dodd-Frank in terms of cost and investment by companies. 20 years after its passage into law, SOX, created to address massive failures in corporate audit and compliance functions, failures in internal controls, cost the average large company about $1.4 million in annual related compliance costs and the average smaller company $890,000 according to their productivity. Uh, and Dodd-Frank Act has its costs. Now, the news here is that ESG is projected to outpace both Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank Act in the cost for compliance. We've got regulations all over. In fact, you know, it depends how you add this up. Sarbanes-Oxley is part of the G in ESG. Part of the G in ESG is internal controls over financial reporting. So Sarbanes-Oxley costs get folded into the G of ESG, which ESG is so much more expansive. There's so much going on here. You have to pay attention to it. How regulations are moving ESG into the risk and compliance field. Duh, that's why we have GRC to deliver on ESG. New regulatory rulemaking around disclosure could push companies and financial services firms to move their ESG activities under the oversight of risk and compliance teams. Last March, the Securities and Exchange Commission announced new environmental, social, and governance disclosure requirements for companies. Under these new rules, public companies must enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures once they're passed. Additional climate risk disclosures, such as the impact of severe weather events and governance risk management processes are required as well. Now, most of the ESG initiatives that I interact with are being led by compliance now because of things like this. Corporate compliance and ethics is the bastion of integrity of the organization, and it's a natural home for ESG. But I also find sometimes it's operational risk, sometimes it's legal, but a lot of times corporate compliance and ethics reports into legal as well. Um, and occasionally in the small to mid-sized organizations, I see audit leading ESG, but, but in a large organization, that doesn't happen because audit should be providing assurance on ESG, not managing ESG. Uh, it'd be a violation of audit's objectives uh, and, in, and independence. But ESG is moving this whole concept into risk and compliance, particularly compliance. The SEC proposes disclosures for funds and asset management advisors making ESG investment claims. A proposed U.S. SEC rule that covers regula regulating environmental, social, and governance-related practices of registered investment companies, business development companies, and private funds managed by registered investment advisors departs from prior SEC practice. This proposed rule, issued a couple months ago, is another signal the SEC is aiming for transparency in the information provided to investors regarding ESG. It's all about that corporate mirror of integrity. What you communicate to the world about your investment practices around ESG, is that a reality in the organization? If you tell the world this, is it really that in the inside? It's all about integrity. The proposed ESG rule can be seen as a companion piece to the corporate climate disclosure regulations that were also proposed in March. 
Diversity training firms applaud blocking of Florida's, Florida's Stop Woke Act. Organizers of corporate diversity training programs cheered a judge's ruling blocking portions of a Florida law that restricted how race is discussed in the workplace. U.S. District Judge Mary Walker in Tallahassee on Thursday issued a preliminary injunction blocking enforcement of the Stop Woke Act championed by Florida's Republican Governor Don, uh, Ron DeSantis. The law likely runs afoul of the U.S. Constitution. Morningstar says the EU's green investment label falls short. Almost a quarter of funds that claim to promote sustainability under European regulations don't deserve that ESG label, according to a fresh review by market researcher Morningstar. The analysis, which looked at funds classified as Article 8 within the EU Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation, shows that 23 PC don't live up to environmental, social, and governance investing principles. Then we have the Xinjiang Rights Report ratchets up standoff between the U.S. and China. China has lashed out at the United Nations Human Rights Agency, calling its assessment of possible crimes against humanity in, in Xinjiang an, an illegitimate report concorded, uh, concocted in cahoots with the U.S., a fire response that underscored Beijing's deepening geopolitical fissures with Western powers. Then companies are failing to recognize the link between bribery, corruption, and ESG abuses. This relates to another article we had just a couple slides back. Global multinational companies are struggling to integrate ESG risk into their compliance programs, according to a survey by Hogan Lobels. The Navigating Deep Water survey found that 82% of compliance officers are concerned that ESG is not embedded in existing risk practices, while 78% report a lack of ESG knowledge and skill. A further 70-57% are concerned about a lack of company-wide engagement with ESG issues. Only 42% said they have a mature ESG compliance program in place. How corporate boards can improve governance and reduce their legal exposure on ESG issues. The interest of investors, consumers, and the public that is expanding beyond environmental issues to include diversity inclusion, social justice, and governance and the corresponding heightened attentions by the, all the regulators around the world has brought new scrutiny to corporations that are reporting and, uh, and statements about these ESG practices and issues. This close examination increased focus by a growing number of stakeholder groups over the last 18 months have forced co corporate boardrooms to pay more attention to how their corporations are reporting information, conveying messages in the media about corporate as um, actions around environmental social governance. Now we'll move over to the area of finance GRC, which includes accounting and internal controls. Ernst & Young leaders expected to approve plan to split accounting company. EY leaders are expected this week to give the green light to splitting its auditing consulting business, paving the way for the biggest shakeup in the accounting profession in more than 20 years. Go again. We have that 20-year figure. What happened 20 years ago? Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, and, and, and that shook up the world. Uh, when we uh, and, and broke up, you know, a lot of these firms and saw the demise of Arthur Anderson. Trust, again, the prime minister of the United Kingdom vows to supercharge the city of London financial services sector. Liz Trust has pledged to maintain the city of London's competitive edge and supercharge growth and investment. If she be, well, she is prime minister uh, um, now. Trust called the city the jewel in the crown of the United Kingdom economy. But for too long, its potential has been held back by the onerous EU regulation. She has promised reforms of Solvency II and MIFID regulation, which some insurance companies say are needed to free up cash to invest in large-scale UK projects. Revolut under, is under pressure to improve internal controls following Audit Watchdog's report. You know, the, 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 the uh, digital bank Revolut is facing pressure from its auditor, BDO, to improve its internal processes after the UK's audit watchdog raised concerns about BDO's audit of the London fintech's uh, company's accounts and these challenger bank world. The fast-growing fintech firm is facing scrutiny from BDO following a report from the UK Financial Reporting Council in July that warned BDO's audit of Revolut was inadequate, the Financial Times first reported. Now we move over to that area of information security and privacy, IT, GRC, hackers, viruses, and worms, oh my. One year later, Amazon GDPR fine details 
remain clouded. You know, the Amazon global data protection regulation fined by the EU is cloudy. And a regulatory <laughs> of filing the company submitted to the U.S. SEC on July 30th, Amazon said the Luxembourg National Commission for Data Protection issued a decision against Amazon Europe claiming the company's processing of personal data did not comply with GDPR. Cloudy in the cloud. Amazon disclosed the decision imposed a fine of 746 million euros as well as unspecified practice revisions. The company added it believed the CNPD's decision is to be without merit and said it intended to appeal. Suspect, suspected Lockbit ransomware attack on Italian tax agency potentially leaked around uh, 100 gigabytes of data. The Italian government authorities are investigating a suspected ransomware attack on the country's tax agency with Lockbit claiming to have stolen 98 gigabytes of data. Identity management firm Entrust suffers a security breach. Ransomware gang obtains files. Online trust and identity management giant Entrust confirmed a security breach by a suspected ransomware gang that accessed data from the company's internal network. GDPR compliance. What is Privacy Shield 2.0? Four years ago, the EU began enforcement of the GDPR. The GDPR is a comprehensive data privacy law enacted to create a standardized and cohesive data privacy framework. The GDPR since encouraged the adoption of data privacy laws throughout the world, such as California's C. CPA. Businesses in the United States that process personal data of EU residents after it has transferred from a country in the e e European economic area to the United States must comply with GDPR. Patchwork of U.S. state regulations becomes more complex as Florida and North Carolina ban ransomware payments. The issue of banning ransomware payments has been contentious and hotly debated in governments throughout the world in the last few years, particularly as the problems seem to grow out of control during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the U.S., the federal government has come down on the side of allowing payments, but adding increasingly stringent incident reporting requirements to get law enforcement involved as fast as possible. Then former security chief at Twitter blows the whistle. Good old Mudge from Cult of the Dead Cow. I remember interacting with him back in the uh, 1990s at the DEF CON conference, the hacker conference in Las Vegas. And I've had many interactions during my Forrester days with Peter Zatko, otherwise known as Mudge back in the day. A former security chief for Twitter has turned whistleblower and, test and testified that the company misled users and U.S. regulators about gaps in its security. Peter Zatko, a.k.a. Mudge, the former security chief in question also claimed that Twitter underestimated how many fake and spam accounts are on its platform, and the accusations could affect the legal battle between Twitter and good old billionaire Elon Musk, who is trying to cancel his $44 billion deal to buy the company. U.S.-Israel finalizes deal on cybersecurity cooperation. The United States and Israel have finalized agreement to work together to protect the financial sector from cybersecurity attacks, the U.S. Treasury Department announced Thursday. The Memorandum of Understanding reached with the Israeli Ministry of Finance follows a partnership between the two agencies made public in November 2021. There's a creation of a bilateral cyber task force was announced uh, during a visit to Israel. Instagram has fined $402 million in the EU for allegedly mishandling children's data. Instagram is being hit with the second largest e European Union privacy fine for allegedly mishandling data about children, ramping up the block's enforcement of its privacy law against big technology companies. Over 47,000 malicious WordPress plugins are active on nearly 25,000 websites. I better go check mine. I use WordPress. Nearly 25,000 WordPress websites contain malicious WordPress plug plugins, according to a study by researchers from George Institute of Technology. I'm very good at my security and up on it. And men have all the fire, WordPress firewalls, everything else. Now we move on to risk and resiliency management. Rising flood prices could become a business risk, analysts say. <clears throat> Rising global prices and shortages of grain and fertilizer stemming from the war in Ukraine could create further economic turmoil, risk and analysts said. In some countries, this could trigger unrest and test the resiliency of Western companies. Then online gambling is growing. So does financial crime risk. The two can work, grow together. Online gambling is booming across the United States and compliance experts caution that it creates opportunities for criminals to launder money or take part in other financial crime. 
Then we move into the third party and supply chain. Today's modern business is not defined by brick and mortar walls and traditional employees. Today's modern organization is the extended enterprise of your outsourcers, service providers, vendors, suppliers, um, brokers, agents, dealers, contractors, consultants, and more. Fourth party risk management is essential for software supply chain security. Third party risk has long been an acknowledged threat to corporate cybersecurity due to the access that partners, contractors, and other trusted parties have to an organization's systems and sensitive data. However, an organization's external security risks extend far beyond its trusted third parties. The solar winds, Kaseya, and similar attacks have underscored the security risks of corporate supply chains. We need to not only look into the third parties, but also the fourth parties, the nth parties. MailChimp security breach compromises DigitalOcean digital customer email addresses, causing friction. Cloud infrastructure company DigitalOcean disclosed that a MailChimp security breach exposed its customer email addresses. U.S. lawmakers press customs on enforcement of Uyghur forced labor law. A company of lawmakers are putting pressure on U.S. customs over the importation of goods from China's Xinjiang region, questioning how it is applying tough new restrictions that have forced many companies to re-examine their supply chain. And then, finally, supply chain risk is a top security priority as confidence in partners wanes. As cyber attackers increasingly look to capitalize on accelerating digitalization that has been seen many enterprises significantly increase their reliance on cloud-based solutions and services, as well as third-party service providers, software supply chain risk has become a major concern for organizations. I'm getting interactions on that regularly. And with that, we have... GRC in the news. Thank you for joining us today and join us next time on the next episode. See you then. I'm Michael Rasmussen, the GRC Pundit.